Hi, everyone, and welcome to Open Door Philosophy. I'm Taylor Jones. Uh, and I'm uh, Mr. Parsons. Hi, everyone. And I'm Andrew Graziano. And welcome to episode 60, where we explore the life and philosophy of one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein. But first, how are you guys doing? Uh, before we do any of that, can we just talk about the fact that that was the, the most brief introduction we've ever done on the show? It's good. Well, I didn't know what to say because it wasn't there on the notes. No, no, I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not casting ad-libbing. blame. I think it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, hi, welcome to Open Door Philosophy. Let's go. <laughs> no, you know, as Polonius said in Hamlet, uh, brevity is the soul of wit. So there you go. So true. I never had to read any Shakespeare for school, ever. Yeah. That's an absolute shame. Mr. Finley made us read Macbeth. That was good. I really Everyone should read Macbeth. Hamlet. Yeah. You can't be a normal human being if you haven't read Hamlet. <laughs> I stand by that. That is the Maybe that can be a future reading episode the philosophy of hamlet Ooh, yeah. or there's tons of stuff in there won't lie it's the uh, famous to be or not to be so oh, wow. mm-hmm. yeah is that the one with huh. the skull yeah last poor york i knew him well yes york the jester it's his skull i'd like to get a skull that would be cool <laughs> i'd Parsons like to get a two skull <laughs> in his two classroom skull. that's right that's right uh, okay, we gotta get back on track here. I'd love to talk about <laughs> Hamlet. Hey, how are you, Andrew? I'm doing pretty good. I'm enjoying the summer vacation, and I mean, I guess I don't really have a summer vacation anymore. But um, I, you're just on vacation for the next year. I'm just aren't on you? vacation for the next year, so that's a good point. <laughs> but I'll just say, eh, over the next year, I will be doing something. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what that is yet, right now. Um, but in 2024, I will be going to Duke for law school. Yes. Very exciting. That's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great, Andrew. Really, really happy and proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. It'll be super, it'll be a super cool change. And I think that we'll have a lot of legal philosophy to talk about in 2024. (laughs) Yeah. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Oh man. We'll have to do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to say bi-coastal. I suppose it's not bi-coastal. Yeah. Uh, no. uh, well, we're Mono on the third coastal? coast. Anyway. We're on the third coast, you know. Oh, that's right. The Gulf of Mexico. Kind of. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, we'll call it bi coastal. We'll have to do bi coastal recordings. We'll do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll do it. Yeah. Okay, how, All right. how are y'all guys? How are you, Mr. Parsons? Uh, I'm good. Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm great. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I had a banger of a storm last night. That was really exciting. Was there a storm? Um, <laughs> did you sleep through it? I guess Apparently. I slept through it. Oh man! I also it was, slept through it. It went for about an hour and a half. Lightning, high wind, rain, heavy rain. Oof. Yeah, it's good times. Yeah, but anyway, aside from that, I just came back from brunch with uh, five very special, important people in my life, and I'm just basking in the afterglow <laughs> of happiness. So I'm doing great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I am. One of those people was Taylor. She was there. <laughs> I'm doing very well. Did just get back from brunch with Mr. Parsons in our high school philosophy class, which was a lot of fun because those aren't people I see or really talk to a whole lot. So we have some had some cool updates. There's beef. Lots of eventful things. What? There's beef. Conflict. There was beef. No No beef. No beef. No beef. We we were completely vegetarian. (laughs) See see what I did? That was very funny. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Well, okay, sounds like we're all doing great. Hey, let's get on to this Ludwig guy. We have to pronounce these W's as V's. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, but we have a mm-hmm. correction to make oh, wait. before we do <laughs> That's that. That's right. We do have a correction to make. It's my correction to make. It's only half a correction. In our last episode on Bertrand Russell, I did admittedly say I was unsure, but uh, Alfred North Whitehead is not American. Uh, he's British. He moved to the United States at the age of 63 in 1924 uh, to be at Harvard and then went to Cambridge after that. He died in 1947 at Cambridge. Uh, and he also, I was, I was a little fuzzy on it. He was not a pragmatist. However, he thought very highly of William James and John Dewey 
and uh, and acknowledged his indebtedness to them in a preface of one of his books, Process and Reality. So not a pragmatist, but uh, and not American. <laughs> so anyway, Alfred North Whitehead. I have a question, kind mm-hmm. of adjacently related. Is John Dewey responsible for the Dewey Decimal System, or is that somebody else? Oh, that's an interesting question. He's really responsible for a lot of the way public education is in the United States. Oh, interesting. I'm going to Google it. Let's see. It was made by Melville Dewey. Mm. Oh, Melville. (laughs) What a great name. (laughs) He was an influential American librarian and educator. Okay. Maybe that was his son. Oh. Uh, Well, it doesn't say so. (laughs) <laughs> his, his legacy is marred by allegations of racism. <laughs> oh, well, we'll just move on from there. I, I'm impressed you guys knew what the Dewey Decimal System is, so I'm feeling very relevant right now. I Even though you probably never it. experienced it. No. Did you? When you were in elementary school, did you have it? Yes, we did. We had to learn oh, about okay. it in the Kiva on a yeah. dragon rug. And we had to find <laughs> books that way. They were like, okay, you got to learn. Awesome. I think it's yeah. I think it's really fascinating, you know, how do you how do you come up with a classification system for something mm-hmm. as wide ranging as a library and, and then especially yeah. if you think about like very large public libraries. And that was uh that was one of the systems that lasted a long time. Nice. They used to have those little little uh drawers that you would pull pull out and there would be cards in there. Huh. And you'd look up you'd look up uh Dewey Decimal that way. I'm unfamiliar. Yeah. Well, now I'm now I'm sounding old. Hey, speaking <laughs> of which, did you guys watch that Bugs Bunny cartoon I sent you? No, I haven't watched it yet. About the Matador. <laughs> okay, no. you guys watch it later. Since you didn't, since you're completely unaware of it. <laughs> <laughs> My age. Hey, let's get on to this. Let's get on to it. Eh? You are not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Taylor. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump into the background. So Ludwig Wittgenstein was born in 1889 into a wealthy and aristocratic family in Austria. He was a brilliant child and he was educated at some of the best schools in the country. After graduating from Cambridge University, Wittgenstein began a career in mathematics and logic. He quickly made a name for himself as a brilliant thinker and he published several important works on these subjects. In the early 1900s, Wittgenstein began to turn his attention to philosophy. He was particularly interested in the philosophy of language, and he published several important works on the subject. Wittgenstein continued to write and lecture until his death from prostate cancer in 1951 at the age of 62. He was a prolific writer, and he published over 20 books and 1,000 articles. Oh man, he was young. I'm so excited to talk about Wittgenstein. (laughs) Are you? <laughs> I'm so excited. I think that he is, I mean, I didn't come up with this. We talked about this on the last episode, but I think he's one of the most interesting philosophers of the 20th century for sure. And oh, hugely influential. Hugely. Yeah. And he is the philosophical dad. Well, I, he's like the thesis advisor or mentor of uh, a lot of great philosophers who I really enjoy. Which, knowing what I know about Wittgenstein, uh, I cannot imagine him as an advisor. Oh my gosh. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that before we get into it? Sure, okay. So I pulled up some facts. Yeah. If you know anything about Wittgenstein, you know that he's a rather eccentric fellow. Yeah. I think we mentioned, this is total conjecture on my part, but last episode uh, I mentioned, you know, if, if Wittgenstein had been around today, he'd probably be diagnosed with autism of some degree. Um, he's a very intense individual, and if you look at any of his photos that exist, uh, you can just you can just tell it. So here's some of his his fun little uh, eccentric things. He liked solitude. So when he was a school teacher in Austria, he had this cabin that he'd retreat to all the time to think and write. But this next one is my favorite cabin. Uh, 1913, when he was in Norway, he constructed himself a small primitive. And when I say primitive, my single room, small stove, no electricity, no running water. He constructed a primitive hut made of logs, and he called this his Hut of Solitude. (laughs) What a great name. And uh, he had like a standing desk. He worked mostly while he was standing. And and if anyone came to visit, they were expected to adjust to his really strict routines and schedules uh, and engage in philosophical discussion and debate. 
So, you know, if you're going there, uh, you're going to be on his timetable and you're going to do the things he wants to do. <laughs> and another thing, and Andrew might have stories about this, but he would also often just abruptly abandon his academic positions yep. and just retreat, just totally retreat from public life. Hmm. Which is why I said it must have been very interesting to have him as a mentor. Let's talk about that last point real quick uh, about sure. how he would just abandon everything. So when he he published his, I don't know, I think it's one of his I mean, it's probably his most famous philosophical work, the Tractatus, in 1921. But he was he wrote it during the summer when he was in military leave in 1918. And during that time, he, I mean, (laughs) he had a tough life. Uh, Wittgenstein had a very tough life. He was very outspoken about his depression when he was at Cambridge, which we'll talk about in a minute. But when... And that's a time when people weren't outspoken about depression. Right. Yeah. And uh, Wittgenstein, he was in school, and when World War I broke out, he his father died basically the same time uh, as, as that. So he, he became... His family is super rich. He became one of the richest men in all of Europe. But... When World War One happened, Wittgenstein immediately volunteered to fight in World War One, even though mm. he didn't have to. Mm. He he had a medical exemption, and he was wounded uh, during that, and he was also captured and spent uh, the last part of the war in an Italian prison camp. Um, oh, I did not know any of that. Wow. Yep, yep. And uh, after he returned home, he he was pretty upset. He he talked a lot about suicide, and re- remember, this is when he had a large amount of money, and he had just he'd finished up at Oxford, where he was one of the brightest students uh, probably to ever go there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So, what do you what would you think that he would do at this point? Right, he would become get his PhD go on and teach and be a cushy academic. What he ended up doing was that he he decided two things on his return from uh, uh, his prison camp. He basically first decided to become an elementary school teacher. And the second thing was to divide the rest of his fortune. So he, he divided it between him and his family. And basically after that, uh, when, when he was looking for a teaching school job, just like you said, Mr. Parsons, uh, this was another time, not when he built his own little hut cabin to do his work in, but he worked as a gardener for a monastery. Uh, so this guy's just, <laughs> just wild and super, super uh-huh. interesting. He's very interesting. Super yeah. interesting guy. Yeah. Elementary school is such an interesting age to choose to teach. But, I mean, they are just such fun kids at that age when they're so young. And I think you can tell a lot about human nature by seeing kids that young. They just kind of go along with whatever they feel so inclined to do. And I think it'd probably be good to balance that out. Like, grueling philosophical work and, like, studying the nature of existence with just the joy of elementary schoolers. Yeah, that's so interesting. Can you imagine like a parent teacher conference with Wittgenstein as the teacher? <laughs> <laughs> These are the drawings Johnny did this this past week. Yeah, <laughs> he's really learning his alphabet well. You know, just mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure if um, if Wittgenstein was doing it out of the joy in his heart for for the education of young minds. <laughs> It, he 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 loved. I think he loved teaching, but mm-hmm. kind of like we've been saying, he was he was a bit eccentric, which is what a lot of people thought of him. And he <laughs> has a lot of interesting reports on uh, how he disciplined uh, the children who he taught with. Huh. He he became. Uh, I th- if I'm getting this right, I think he became a legend in that town for yelling at these kids and calling them coleslaw and. Uh, <laughs> oh. And and things oh, no. of things like that. So he it's he's he's an interesting guy, but he apparently spent like a lot of time teaching them math, which was probably something he loved. You know, when I think of insults to hurl at children, coleslaw is the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One more bit of an ex, uh, uh, eccentric tendency that I think that um, kind of relates to this podcast almost is that. He loved to retreat to places, and and one of the places that he uh, retreated to in 1913 when he was working on some of his books, basically the predecessor to his Tractatus. So he went to Norway in the middle of nowhere for the winter, which sounds 
miserable. But while he was there, he he just learned Norwegian and Danish. Oh, just you know, for fun. Yeah, right? just for fun. And he he learned Norwegian <laughs> to talk, and he learned Danish just to read Kierkegaard. Yeah, brilliant mind. Wow. Yeah, that was when he was in his hut of solitude, and he left because it became too busy for him. Yeah. You know, as a teacher, not elementary school teacher, but once he began uh, teaching at college, he was really known for being just an adversarial, confrontational teacher. And he would even sometimes get so heated in these debates with students that he would throw things. And, you know, just a just an intense guy. (laughs) <laughs> That's why I said I really think it'd be interesting to have him as a as a mentor. No doubt. He has a couple, uh, no surprise, quirky uh, personal habits. He always insisted on having his breakfast and his tea served at very specific times. Not a minute before, not a minute later. He would meticulously arrange objects on his desk as he was writing. And uh, this is probably my favorite one, although you've brought up some funny ones too, Andrew. And I suppose I shouldn't call it funny. It comes off as funny to me, but... Uh, it's because he was just had a hard time adjusting to things. He became dissatisfied with the height of the door frames and the ceiling in his residence at while he was at Cambridge. So rather than moving to a new residence, he just adjusted the heights of these door frames and ceiling, sometimes just by an inch or two. And he did it himself. He didn't contract this out. So, I mean, he adjusted door frames like an inch or two because it just... It wasn't the right height. In the, I don't know how you. I don't know how you raise a ceiling. I don't know how that happens. I guess a handy guy. Brought the Home Depot a lot. <laughs> Amazing man. Amazing man. I guess in England, Home Depot would be like cottage depository. Oh gosh. <laughs> so many dad jokes today. <laughs> it's great. Huh? <laughs> Oh, man. Let's talk a little bit about his his education, his his arrival at Cambridge. Okay. Because I think that's that's a very important part in his life. Wittgenstein, which you might be able to get from the name, was not British. He was born in Vienna and he, he eventually came to England for schooling. And he actually began his his schooling in Berlin and got a diploma in I think it was in engineering. And he worked for some time. He had a deep interest in aeronautics. And we we can see his fascination with math. I mean, that's just, of course, one instance. But it was the work of Russell and another guy at Cambridge, their work in math, that uh, got him interested in the more theoretical side of of mathematics and, and philosophy. And he... Basically, one of those, one was Russell, who he was interested in, and the other uh, guy's name was Gottlob Frege. I think that's how you pronounce it. Wittgenstein uh, liked the work of Freg more, who was a German, but he advised him to go to study with Russell in Cambridge, like we learned about last last time. Uh, Wittgenstein really was more interested in uh, the philosophical side of mathematics and, and would come to Russell's lectures and... I guess dominate them is the word that that people say about it. But I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm sure he was obsessive. Wittgenstein was was around some of the smartest people I think in mm-hmm. in Cambridge. Not only with Russell, but with G. E. Moore, who we uh, talked a little bit about in our last episode, a great philosopher, but also one of the most revolutionary economists, John Keynes who invited Wittgenstein to join a, a super elite society in Cambridge called the Cambridge Apostles, who would debate moral and, and philosophical topics. So what do y'all think about that? What do you think about his his educational time? Well, I mean, if you look at some of the greatest philosophers, they're always, they always seem to be educated by one of the greatest philosophers who came before them. Yep. You start right off the bat with Aristotle, who was the student of Plato. No doubt having Russell and those other influential philosophers being a part, I mean, it becomes a part of his heritage and he adopts this analytic tradition and carries it on. And then he passes it on to other people, of course. Elizabeth Anscombe comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it's a cool part of the philosophical tradition that so much of philosophy is passed down, not just through reading other people's works, but by being able to go to their actual lectures and visit with people directly, like other philosophers that came before you. And just such a cool opportunity, too, to be in the same time and place as some of these great names. 
and then that's a big part of the reason why you yourself become great. Yeah, that's the big advantage of going to Cambridge and Oxford. Well, that's true. Yeah, I was thinking that. I mean, if you're if you're in Oxford, uh, yeah. I mean, you're kind of the epicenter of of analytical philosophy. Yep, you're just going to rub shoulders with or elbows, shoulders, elbows, elbows. You're going to rub elbows with all kinds of uh, all kinds of really significant people that's just that's just what oxford is yep whether it's politicians or um, yep prime ministers yep. philosophers scientists etc in the last episode on russell i mentioned that there's these great interviews with uh with russell he talks a little bit about wittgenstein and his first impressions of him he was queer and his notions seemed to me to be odd so that for the whole term i could not make my mind up whether he was a man of genius or merely an eccentric at the end of his first term at Cambridge, he came to me and said, Will you please tell me whether I am a complete idiot or not? If I am a complete idiot, I shall become an aeronaut. But if not, I shall become a philosopher. I told him to write me something during the vacation on some philosophical subject, and I would then mm-hmm. tell him whether he was a complete idiot or not. At the beginning of the <laughs> following term, he brought me the fulfillment of this suggestion. After reading only one sentence, I said to him, No, no. You must not become an aeronaut, and he didn't. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do this with my students after year <laughs> one. Over the summer, they have to write me something philosophical, and then I will tell them if they're an idiot or not. Like, I come back from summer break. And I'm like, hello, hello, welcome everyone. Three of you are idiots. Come back for summer break, and they're just not back in your class. You just kick them from the class. <laughs> What I think is super interesting is that from when uh, Russell's Mm -hmm. an old man, and that's after Wittgenstein and Russell had not agreed with each other in a very long time. Um, And so so I think what we see from there on Russell's end is a lot of respect Mm. for his former student. Uh, He was he's not trashing his name, even after Wittgenstein and Russell uh, uh, disagree vehemently. And on the other side, we know for a fact that mm-hmm. Wittgenstein disagreed heavily, but thought that Russell was the only person in the world who could understand what he was writing. In a letter to Russell, Wittgenstein wrote that he thought you're the only, he said, I think you're the mm-hmm. only one who can really help me in his work. So just a lot of respect between these disagreeing philosophers. And I, I think it's really um, inspiring and uh, something that we should take away from from a great relationship. Well, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be, and that's something we try to teach in philosophy classes. Look, we're all going to disagree with each other on on various things. But at the end of the day, we still have to acknowledge the value of those arguments, whether we agree with them or not, and and challenge those arguments if they're weak arguments. But when we're all done, we're we still respect each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we're going to move on to Wittgenstein's philosophy and get into his theories and why he is so significant in the 20th century. One of the things I find really interesting about Wittgenstein is that he completely changes his mind on his major groundbreaking theories that he made early in the 1920s to by the time that he dies in the 1960s. He completely changes his mind, and you usually don't see that with philosophers they might entertain other ideas. They might shift around on some other ideas. But to do a 180, it's pretty impressive, just from a, sort of a reputational standpoint. So that's something I think that's very unique about him. So let's talk about the book that is his initial theories, and then we'll talk about his later, later book that does the 180. And this all has to do with language. So his first book that we're going to talk about, it was published in 1921 in German, and then 1922 in English. It's the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. And we're just going to call it the Tractatus, because that's shorter. But it sounds very cool. Yeah. Because Latin's cool. (laughs) Before I kind of unpack it, I want to ask you guys a a question. I'll I'll see if Taylor will answer this question first. So, Taylor, when when you make words, whether you're verbalizing them or whether you're thinking them inside of your head, what's associated with those words? How does that work? Does anything appear in your head when you think of certain words? Like word association or when I'm trying to piece together something to say? Well, kind of both. I think... Wouldn't you say, Andrew? Go ahead. Taylor, 
I'm going to say something, and I want you to give me your thoughts on it. Okay. Purple elephant with yellow wings. That I can picture. Like, I can see it in my head. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now imagine a green gate. Yeah, I can see that. Like, imagine what it looks like. Now, don't even imagine. I'm just going to say a word, okay? Okay. And tell, tell me your thoughts. Game. Well, right now, it makes me think of game theory, because most recently, I was in a class where we talked about game theory and, like, the logic of how things piece together. But then there's also, like, board games and stuff. Yeah, for me, when you say game, the first thing that kind of pops in head is, is actually a board mm-hmm. game. Maybe, like, Monopoly, something like mm-hmm. that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then my second thought was video games. But, like, which game and which video game and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. It's like if I said water bottle, and both of you guys just got pictures of water bottles in your head. They're different water bottles, I'm sure. So that's the whole idea of his first book, the Tractatus. It argues for this thing that he called picture theory of language. So picture theory of language suggests that our language, the language that we use, is a system of meaningful symbols that represent states of affairs in the world. So Wittgenstein, uh, like meaningful propositions, these can be el- these can be analyzed into elementary propositions, which correspond to atomic facts about the world we can break things down into smaller parts when we talk about language and and picture theory of language so when you think about the importance of the types of words that we use that we should use them as accurately as possible and should describe the world as accurately as possible language becomes incredibly important the types of words that you use now there's a group of people at this time called the Vienna Circle who were logical positivists and I feel like we've talked about them before but the logical positives believed that a sentence did not have meaning unless it was objective unless the sentence was was objective or rather had objective language in it so for instance if I said ah Andrew I love you the sentence would have no meaning because love cannot be objective whereas I could say two plus two is four you're like aha yes this has meaning Right. So Wittgenstein was not a logical positivist, but he was very close to it and was certainly aware of their theories. So this whole logical form of a, of a proposition reveals this necessary relationship between objects and states of affairs. And one of his quotes from the Tractatus is the general form of a proposition is this is how things stand. And that leads and this is where it kind of sounds logical positivistic. If that's the right term. There are limits to what we can meaningfully express through language, right? There are limits to what we can meaningfully express through language. And so Wittgenstein argues that there are these areas that cannot be captured by language and thus should remain unsaid. And Wittgenstein's known for many famous quotes, and this is one of them from Tractatus 7. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Yep. So let's take that and like apply it to some examples that you guys can maybe think of about the limits of language and what can be meaningfully expressed through language. I can tell you about two big ones. I mean, a big criticism that at least comes comes out of this book is that it's almost impossible for us to talk about certain areas of philosophy, namely ethics and aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Not that it's wrong for us to talk about these. It's more of a waste of time because these areas, they, uh, what's the word? They, they're they just areas where the truth, like the truth claims behind them are such that they can't be expressed in language. And so they're, they're just kind of pointless to talk about. We'll see the implications of this theory in a few weeks with some, some great philosophers namely one of Wittgenstein's students, Anscombe, pushes this down the pipeline, and, and it's really led to a whole revival, or not revival, a whole field in, in ethics. We've talked about this, I think, in class, Mr. Parsons, like in high school, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it makes me think of the thought experiment, Mary's Room. Frank Jackson explores where the breaches of objective knowledge end and like what the subjective experience has to add to knowledge. And I think Mm -hmm. it's something similar that at least from my perspective, the subjective experience has a lot more nuanced meaning. I guess maybe that's Mm -hmm. not what I'm trying to say. It has a lot more meaning to me than 
objective reality because two plus two is always going to be four but what you experience isn't always going to be the same so when you start saying that anything that's not objective doesn't have meaning you're almost in danger of ruling out everything because you can't escape your subjectivity like you can't look at something from nowhere there is no view from nowhere and i think that that's a really dangerous position to take why do you think it's dangerous i agree but why do you think it's dangerous if you say that things that aren't objective have no meaning you're saying that everything that's subjective any subjective statement is meaningless which can be translated to mean that the subjective reality is meaningless and that somebody's personal experience doesn't have any meaning because there is no objectivity behind it and you can't prove factually that anything happened or that their perspective exists. I think that comes close to ruling out the impacts of personhood or it can. Yeah, no, that's great. There's a hop in the English channel over on the continental side of things. uh, There's a rival school to this. It's called phenomenology and Mm -hmm. uh, it takes into a account of all the things that you're talking about the experience of of everything in the world and uh yeah no that's uh, i don't know if Wittgenstein was writing against that necessarily mm-hmm. uh, but they are two contrasting views in, in relation to knowledge well let me let me just maybe clarify something too i don't think his point is that subjective experiences are meaningless in fact that's that's not what he's trying to do instead he is putting subjective experiences into a different camp than from objective Mm -hmm. experiences. And I think this is important because it's probably true uh, to some extent, which which is kind of funny. If there's nothing, his point is that if, if a proposition can't be expressed in language, which ethics and aesthetics can't, then it's it's not really subject to to terms like knowledge, something you can be knowledgeable about, or mm-hmm. something that has a, some truth behind them. It's not it's not true in an ethical mm-hmm. system. It might not be true, but those fields are about value and they're about meaning, and they might how we feel and what we value and what we find meaningful. Um, that's that's might be how we live our lives. And, and that should how we live our lives. And um, the sixth part of the uh, Tractatus, Wittgenstein famously writes, ethics is not a theory, it's a practice. Mm. And it's really about, it's not something that we really need because we can't put these things into words and we can't r- really be precise with them. It's not necessarily something we need to subject to philosophical debate. And that's probably where you get that division between the logical positivist and Wittgenstein. They're kind of adjacent to each other, but he doesn't mm-hmm. go as far as the logical positivist. No, and I think this is a really great point in, in showing what the Tractatus is about. The purpose of it is show is to show the purpose of philosophy. That's what the book is about. Yeah. And, and, and his point really is that the purpose of philosophy is to show the limits of language and to, to kind of narrow the field and in some sense take ethics and aesthetics out of that, at least at least for now. I've heard this before when people talk about this book that every single field uh, in, in science has some kind of grounding text that narrows the field and bounds it in, right? Uh, physics is unconcerned with well, maybe it's not unconcerned with, but it's not the primary job of a physicist to explore the makeup of the brain. We would just think that's silly. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's what I think, what a similar aim here mm-hmm. is in the Tractatus. He, he's wanting to narrow that field mm-hmm. a little bit for philosophers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, in my class, depending on which topic I decide to teach first each year, Wittgenstein comes up significantly in both ethics, you've mentioned that already, but also in philosophy of religion. Yeah and with philosophy of religion, religious language, and what we mean by certain phrases. For instance, God is real. You know, is that a meaningful statement? Can that, is there some limit to what can be meaningfully expressed through language when I say God is real? And, you know, what's funny is with the Tractatus, the the answer is yes, absolutely. But when we get to philosophical investigations, 
he's like, hey, you know what? Let's talk about the context of all that. So yeah, Wittgenstein is uh, fundamental when it comes to any type of philosophical language in an attempt to explain things in clear terms. Okay, well, let's move on to the 180 and let's talk about philosophical investigations. It was uh, published after he died, but very, very quickly after he died. And so I just want to read the back cover of my particular copy that I have of this. Because in this episode, maybe the previous episode, we said Wittgenstein is one of the most significant philosophers of the 20th century. Listen to this little quote. Immediately upon its posthumous publication in 1953... Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations was held as a masterpiece, and the ensuing years have confirmed this initial assess assessment. Today, it is widely acknowledged to be the single most important philosophical work of the 20th century. Now, my friends, that's what we call a big yep. claim. Yep. So let's talk about it. Let's do it. All right. So like we said, this is a 180 from the Tractatus, and... Again, I think it's a remarkable thing about Wittgenstein. So we have a number of topics to talk about it, being it's, you know, the single most significant philosophical work in the 20th century. We're just going to cover it real quick. <laughs> just a few minutes. So what is language and meaning? So like I said, with the Tractatus, it, it proposes this picture theory of language and emphasize this idea that language consists of atomic, logically structured propositions. Yeah, I think we expressed that relatively well. Philosophical investigations investigations takes this approach. Wittgenstein focuses on language as a form of human activity, emphasizing its use in various language games, we'll talk about language games in a minute, and context-dependent nature of meaning. And boy, right there, the context-dependent nature of meaning is the mm -hmm. 180. Yeah. Whereas earlier, you know, Whereof one cannot speak, therefore one must be silent, and there are limits to what can be meaningfully expressed through language. Now we're saying language is context-dependent, mm. or the meaning of language is context-dependent. So he explores mm -hmm. how meaning is derived from the practical use of language within specific social and cultural contexts. So that's, that's why we call a 180. Okay. And one of his famous quotes from, uh, from, from 43rd, mm -hmm. the meaning of a word is its use in the language. That's what the meaning of a word is, how it's used in the language. I think the, uh, I kind of slipped, I slipped a short one in earlier uh, when I was asking y'all to, I was using the most famous example of this that, that Wittgenstein uses when he's talking about uh, context-specific language. And language games. Mm -hmm. When I asked uh, people to think of the word game, Taylor talked mm -hmm. about game theory. Mm -hmm. Mr. Parsons uh, thought of a board game. I thought about mm -hmm. a football game. The the way that the word game has different meanings depending on the context that's being used. If we were at a football game, yep. and 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 I said, "Oh yeah, I love this game." Uh, none yeah. of us are going to be thinking about. Yeah, I'm talking about the Monopoly game at my house, right? Probably not. It's 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 the the word has a certain meaning in that certain context, and and even we, we're talking about these like I mean Taylor did a, a really good uh, giving a really good example of a different use of the word game. I was just reading a book that talks about um, the game of life, mm. uh, and so there's so many different just, uh, a word. Uh, Wittgenstein's point is that a word's meaning. I mean, imagine now in your head a picture, like he was arguing in the mm -hmm. Tractatus, of, of uh, imagine a picture of the word game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have one set meaning. It's a very fluid meaning that depends upon mm -hmm. the context of its use. And that's, that's, the, that's the point in the language game. This not only is kind of, Im has implications in the philosophy of language, but mm -hmm. also in, a, in oh, epistemology yeah. Yeah. too. We can think about different worlds, what a word might mean on a different, uh, different world. Subjectivity across, I mean, language across different cultures. And it's even, even relates really well to probably my favorite philosophical thought experiment, which we, I guess we can talk about in a minute too. But what do y'all think about this? 
uh, this concept of, of language games and, and context uh, dependent meaning? I think it's really interesting and I think that rings true in my personal experience that context really is defining for what the specific words that you use mean but it makes me think I think this was a speech given by bell hooks and then the famous Audre Lord. I think it's a speech as well the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house where they both talk about the importance of language and including people's communal vernacular hooks talks about this is language teaching new world slash new words where she argues that it's really important to make space for things like black vernacular in academic circles because that language makes academia inclusive and opens it up to people so they can understand what's being said and that the words that they're using portray something fundamental about their experience Mm -hmm. and This idea is kind of reminding me of that. And I think those are both very powerful speeches. If anybody is interested in how, like a female perspective on language, I definitely recommend those. Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about language worlds. Absolutely. A a woman's world Mm -hmm. versus a man's and the type of language that's used and the underlying meanings that go unspoken with certain languages and both of those language worlds. And then we can Mm -hmm. also think about, I'm sure many people have had the experience of where they've traveled to Uh, different parts of a country or to different countries that use the same language that you use, but they have entirely different, uh, different words and meanings and and phrases and colloquialisms. And you're just like, I don't even know what these people are saying. I know we're all both speaking English, you know, and and Andrew earlier, you mentioned Mm -hmm. football. Well, heck, if you're in London, you're like, oh man, I want to see a football game. They'd be like, hey, let's go, Man City versus Man mm-hmm. <laughs> Man United. You'd be like, what are you talking about? They're like, oh, you silly American. <laughs> Soccer. It's just a simple example. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I can remember when I was in Ireland, they, although there is an Irish language in some many places it is spoken, they largely speak English. And we spent a lot of time in rural towns, those small towns. And man, let me tell you, mm-hmm. it was in some cases, it was almost impossible to understand what they were saying, even though they were speaking mm-hmm. English. So that's not only their dialect um, or their accents, but it's also just the words they're using is very different words. And so like my brain just can't string those words together with meaning, even though I can understand what they're saying. Mm-hmm. One thing that Hook says is that shifting how we think about language and how we use it necessarily alters how we know what we know. And just the point that the words that you use change your fundamental knowledge of a concept, I think is really interesting and a really powerful idea, especially when you think of something like philosophy that doesn't have as many objective things to go off of as something like Mm -hmm. chemistry, where no matter what language you're studying chemistry in, you can get the same information from it, whether it's English or French or Greek or Arabic, it's all going to be the same. But philosophy, language is so rich with meaning that so many things are altered in translation and just based on even how you think about the words being used. Oh, yeah. Heck, don't even, I mean, philosophy aside, I think about (laughs) our our experience in the world, how we exist in Mm -hmm. the world the language that we use to describe it is, is so rich. Just our experience. My favorite philosophical, I think it's my favorite philosophical thought experiment that Wittgenstein raises in, I'm pretty sure it's in the PI, Philosophical Investigations, where he says, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. Mm-hmm. Mm. His point there is that even if, say, that we we had some kind of translator that could allow a lion to speak, you know, English or, or, or whatever, some human language, we mm. would probably not be able to understand what it was saying or what it was talking about, or it wouldn't be even be able to understand us because we don't have the same concepts about the of certain words as they do. If a lion had a concept of a game, mm-hmm. I mean, it could be something completely different from ours or, or, or a tree. You know, it can be completely different. And that's not even counting Mm -hmm. the basics of language, such as like the words like from, that, is, to, 
these basic basic building blocks of language. There's that. Is it? I think it's the. I think it's Disney. The movie Up, where the dog Doug has that <laughs> translator thing around his neck. Uh-huh. You know, I always think of this yeah. when I see it, and and that's a great example because Doug can understand. The translator makes him speak English for most of the movie, and you know the dog's able to understand. We're able to understand the dog, and and things go over smoothly. But mm-hmm. in this thought experiment, which I think is quite interesting, Wittgenstein's point is that it sees the world so differently, and it's it's probably we'd probably not even be able to understand it at all. Mm-hmm. I think it's super cool. It is, and and this is what I mean when I say language worlds. Right? Uh, there's an entire context and concepts mm-hmm. wrapped up in the world of a lion that we just simply don't get. I mean, we yeah. can observe them and see what they're doing, but there there are, would there would be customs, there would be concepts, there would be all kinds of things that are in that particular world, which is why it wouldn't make any sense. And this is exactly what Wittgenstein is talking about when he talks about language games. Uh, you got to know the rules of the language in order for it to make mm-hmm. sense. And by the way, he, he said language games is everything from everyday conversations to really complex situations like legal discourse or artistic expression or scientific debates or something like that mm. to like, you know, simple conversations where it's like just giving and following instructions of how to get to the restaurant down the road. So each of these mm-hmm. games, they, they have their own sets of rules, conventions, patterns of language use, all, all of it, phrases, expressions. This is language games. So that's why if a lion could talk, we would not be able to understand him. I have a friend who is, he's like blind in one eye and he can see out of the other eye. And I think, I forget how it came up, but the, eventually the, the conversation somehow came to him describing uh, what he sees in the eye that, that is blind. And it, it was just such an interesting, such an interesting conversation because I could not understand what he was talking about. I could not mm. imagine it. And, and it's really, I think in his case, it's really interesting because in the one eye he can see and the other eye is completely blind. Mm-hmm. And what he described to me, he said, when I close my, I think his left eye and his left eye, he's blind and his right eye, he can see. And he says that in his right eye, he, I mean, it's when he closes his right eye, it's nothing like what he sees when he, you know, in his left eye, when he's blind. And so I think, I mean, even those simple human experiences where something is, I mean, he's human, he speaks English, but even something so slight as blindness is so incommunicable. Even just imagining a different animal or or something like that, I think it's just so fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of all, all the stuff we're talking about reminds me of another famous quote by Wittgenstein, which is, the limits of my language is the limits of my world. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you think about going to another country of a language that you do not mm. speak. Uh, oof, yeah. Uh, you are very limited. Yeah, for sure. Even if it's just a different dialect, I think of French learning like academic French versus colloquial French in France versus Canadian French versus the French that they speak in Louisiana. Those are four different languages effectively. Mm-hmm. And you can know a language like French inside a classroom and be able to communicate with your classmates. And then maybe be able to communicate in France if you've learned, like, French French, but not communicate as well somewhere like Canada, where they speak a completely different dialect. Oh, yeah. And, you know, this makes me think, you know, uh, you mentioned so many different groups. It makes me think of marginalized groups, too, and how language over the Mm -hmm. centuries has been used to control if language, if the limits of your yeah. language is the limits of your world, and we don't allow certain communities that communicate in a different way into the world that is of the strongest economy, the strongest academics, mm-hmm. we literally limit those people's world in all kinds of ways, yeah, economically and academically. Yeah, that's a big part about what Hooks and Lord were yeah. advocating for and opening up spaces to. African Americans and people that didn't they just didn't speak a standard English mm-hmm. language and to women because they were so excluded. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I thought that a lot of 
covers of Philosophical Investigations have this duck rabbit, really famous sketch on the cover of it. Uh, we're not able to find any now, but I think uh, Wittgenstein's often associated with this image for a discussion that he t- he talks about in uh, Philosophical Investigations, which is a distinction between um, seeing that and seeing as. This is a distinction that Wittgenstein uh, draws in, in seeing the world. If we think of seeing that is a really clear, maybe not clear, but a, um, maybe a more objective way of seeing the world. If we imagine a, a table or a chair or a car or something, uh, when we see it, we see that object we recognize it for what it is. So if I put a, I don't know, a car uh, in front of you, you're going to recognize its function pretty simply. You're going to recognize what it does. And in most cases of that, you're, it's not going to be necessarily a context-dependent thing. You're going to see it for what it is. The other side of that coin that Wittgenstein draws is seeing something as seeing it as... Uh, which is a way more complex way of seeing something. And this is where the duck rabbit uh, illustration is is kind of referenced, I guess. Seeing something as something, or seeing as, is seeing something in a particular way. So when we look at this duck rabbit, I was just doing this while I was looking for this. Let's, I mean, people can pull this up right now, this image of this duck rabbit. I see it originally as a duck, but I can also see it as a rabbit, too. And I'm sure that's pretty much how everyone sees it, right? Maybe they see the rabbit more. Probably depends on the illustration. But we're seeing this illustration as that thing in that moment. But to say that it is something is necessarily right, because it's both a duck and a rabbit. But how we see it depends on just how we're seeing it in that second. Maybe we're forcing ourselves to see it as a rabbit, we're forcing ourselves to see it as a duck. But w- when we look at it, we're not seeing it necessarily as something super objective. But the way that we're perceiving it, we're seeing it as something. And that's just a distinction that Wittgenstein draws in the PI to, to argue that the way that we see the world is, or is basically essential in, in the way that we understand it. He's famously quoted as saying that we see the world through a web of beliefs and desires, and that shapes how we see things. And this is, a, I think, a really, really, really influential um, thought, not only in the philosophy of mind, but also the philosophy of language and the philosophy of art. In the philosophy of mind, I think this is really trippy. He argues, or, or people after him, I think a really famous Wittgenstein interpreter is Saul Kripke, works at NYU, a really prominent modern philosopher. And he argues that language, for philosophy of the mind, the mind is not a private thing, but it's something that's shared with others through language. And I think that's super, super trippy. What do you all think about that? Do you think that the mind, I mean, we think about that as some kind of internal thing in our head. Do we think that's something that's a private thing? Well, at first hearing, I mean, it does seem to make sense that the mind is not entirely private. Now, I wouldn't say it's wholly on display, but yeah, I mean, sure. The types of language that we use to describe our reality and what we're thinking can, can only be done through our mind as we generate that, which means it's coming through that particular lens, whether you want to call that webs or, or whatever it is that you said. Was it webs? I don't know. So that seems to ring true. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good argument against solipsism. Yeah. I agree with Mr. Parsons. I think that the mind isn't entirely public or private, but because there's overlap, you can't not do things from your own perspective and you can't hide how you view the world because that's just so intrinsic to our being that you can't keep everything private. It kind of makes me think of Martin Buber's I and Thou where he talks about how people see others shapes how they interact with them Mm. and that the ultimate way to see someone is as your equal, not as a lesser being and to 
view someone as an individual equal, not as a member of a group. Because at the end of the day, they're also their own person with their own worldview and their own beliefs and thoughts. And so are you. Uh, Boober's really great. You know, as long as we're using analogies, yeah. now I'm kind of thinking of if we're talking about language as being representative of our mind. Uh, I kind of like to think of it as breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs to mm. to what is actually in our mind, which is inaccessible, mm -hmm. but we can get hints of it, of what a person is and the way that they leave those breadcrumbs behind. I don't know. Where, where are you on all this, Andrew? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Taylor. Oh, I was going to say, I think we reveal things we don't intend to in our language. Mm. Mm, yeah. Things that we don't even realize that we're conveying based on the words that we pick. Mm. That it's not always conscious. Where are you at on all this, Andrew? I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't really have an opinion. I, I don't know if it's. I haven't thought about it. If it's. If it's true or false. I think it's really interesting. This this goes to Wittgenstein's mm -hmm. argument of private language and private language being impossible because. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we don't. I guess we don't need to get in it on this, on this episode. But Wittgenstein thinks that there needs to be at least two people for, for language to be verified, I think. Um, or at least the words of language have to have to at least involve someone else. I think it's super interesting, but at the end of the day, I don't know. If you find Wittgenstein very interesting, you should check out a probably philosophical investigations, but I think that Kripke is usually probably most loved follower Saul Kripke, probably the way to go for an explanation on all of this, because Wittgenstein is very not fun to read. I think that his Tractatus is, is unbearable. He's famous. Okay, I, was, I wanted to bring this up earlier because I thought it was so funny. He, um, during his doctoral dissertation, he um, really did not want to, want to do this, but he was convinced, basically, to bring his Tractatus as his dissertation yeah that's that russell convinced him to bring it even though he wasn't in love with it and so he his examiners were uh russell himself and ge moore two of the brightest philosophers of all time so he goes into the uh, thesis defense room he goes up and at the end of it he's explained it for however long and he claps the two guys on the back and he says don't worry guys, I know you'll never understand this. <laughs> and more after that, he wrote in the, the paper, he said, I myself consider that this is a work of genius. But even if I am completely mistaken, and it is nothing of the sort, it is well above the standard required for the PhD degree. And so, I mean, even these great, some of the greatest philosophers of all time <laughs> had immense trouble understanding mm. uh, Wittgenstein. So, uh, maybe read like some, I hate recommending secondary literature for things, but this is, if you're going to do it, probably the time to do it here. Yeah. Sounds like a great summer beach read, you know, <laughs> Yeah, the Tractatus. I mean, the Tractatus is like 75 pages, so maybe, but it's un unbearable. It's unbearable. It sucks to read. You know, a little umbrella, one of those, uh, Cabana Boy brings you a a little martini, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you'll probably need the martini to read it. No Emily Henry this summer. Forget beach read. <laughs> the track taught us is your beach read. All right, everybody. Well, that's the end of a very long, but uh, I think pretty good uh, introduction to Wittgenstein. It was a lot of fun, and I think that uh, we'll see some overlap in our explorations of some of his predecessors uh, when we look at the Oxford Four starting, I guess, two weeks from now. Yes, that's right. Andrew will be back in two weeks with another episode of Open Door Philosophy. And if you like this episode or you want to communicate any of anything to us, please feel free to do that on our social media at Open Door Philosophy. So that's Instagram, or you can email us at contact.opendoorphilosophy.com or check out our YouTube and leave us comments. Andrew is hard at work on getting everything uploaded there and staying up to date. Yeah, we'd love to play language games with you. So please contact us. Yeah, and so, you know, speaking of, of language, I would like to express appreciation to Mr. Kevin McLeod for the use of his free music. It's so groovy, you can check it out all over the internet. And, hey guys, 
that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Remember, when your life is in need of some philosophy, that door is always open. See you later. <laughs>